Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mujin. I'm a first year CS PhD student at Stanford. Um, today I'll be presenting a project that we recently released called OpenVLA, an, an open source vision language action model. And this was a big collaboration with folks from Stanford, Berkeley, and MIT, as well as Toyota Research Institute, Google DeepMind, and Physical Intelligence. Um, feel free to interrupt if you have burning clarification questions, but otherwise, uh, please save your questions till the end because I may answer it uh, with a future slide. Um, I also can't see uh, any of you or uh, see any hands raised right now, um, so uh, please just speak up if you have a burning clarification question. And, and yeah, Mujin, I'll, I'll also help with moderation, so I'll be able to catch questions so you don't have to be constantly watching the um, the messages, and I'll be able to pick them up for you. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. So let's get started. Um, yeah, so to provide a little bit of motivation, uh, one successful formula that we've seen in natural language processing and computer vision is to first pre-train a large uh, what's called a foundation model uh, on tons and tons of data. Um, and second, uh, fine tune or actually deploy at zero shots uh, on some specific downstream task. Uh, and this is a general formula that uh, has yielded great performance on various uh, different tasks in many domains. And it has been popularized by um, BERT as well as other works that have followed. Um, but in robotics, historically, this approach hasn't been as popular. Um, and why is that? Um, for one reason, like data has been really the bottleneck. It's been really hard to collect uh, large amounts of data in the real world because you have to actually go out and um, use hardware and uh, interact with physical objects. Um, however, recent trends have shown promise for a similar formula that uh, may be promising in robotics. Uh, first, the OpenX embodiment data set was this large uh, project where um, they aggregated uh, over 2 million robot episodes from over 20 robots and 20 different institutions. Uh, so that's on the data side. And second, uh, there was this work called RT2. Uh, and the idea there was to take pre-trained vision language models, or VLMs, and fine tune them to do robotic control specifically. Um, this was the paper that coined the term VLA, uh, which stands for Vision Language Action Model. And um, the idea here is that these VLMs uh, contain a lot of uh, semantic knowledge from their internet scale pre-training. Uh, and this semantic knowledge can be used to enhance the robot policies, generalization and reasoning capability um, later on. And um, what they found is that the robot can actually generalize beyond the uh, physical interaction data uh, that it's trained on. Um, another uh, useful thing here is that uh, they used a really high capacity model. Um, these vision language models typically have uh, many billions of parameters. Um, RT2 and RT2X specifically have 55 billion parameters. Um, and these models are uh, very expressive and capable of fitting large, diverse data sets. Uh, since RT2 has uh, been developed, uh, there have been many more VLA models that have been um, developed. And uh, this includes uh, models like Covariance RFM1, uh, Microsoft Research Interactive Agents Foundation Model, uh, and several more. Um, however, all of these models are either private um, so they're closed source and other people can't access them, or they're trained on uh, simulated robot data only. Uh, so this is where we come in uh, with the OpenVLA project. And for the OpenVLA project, um, we wanted to first develop a strong open source uh, VLA model trained on lots and lots of real world uh, robot data. Um, and we wanted to create a generalist manipulation policy, which means um, it's a model that can perform uh, diverse tasks on uh, many different robots just out of the box. Um, and for example, here are some uh, tasks that uh, can be performed. And uh, the second goal was to develop an effective framework for 
uh, adapting to downstream tasks. Uh, and this includes parameter efficient uh, fine tuning techniques such as LoRa. Um, and with these techniques, um, we want to show that you can fine tune the model uh, even if you have a low compute budget. Um, the third main goal was to uh, release all uh, pre training and fine tuning code, um, all the model weights, and all the uh, data mixtures that we trained on uh, publicly. And uh, yeah, we just wanted to. Uh, enable others to um, advance research uh, on BLA models um, and just large pre-training in general for robotics. Cool. Okay, so uh, this is our main figure one that you'll see in the paper. Uh, let me just break it down for you. So first, uh, what is OpenVLA? Uh, OpenVLA is just a 7 billion parameter VLA model uh, built on top of uh, a Prismatic VLM backbone. Uh, Prismatic VLM was a project uh, released by uh, one of our co-authors, uh, Sid, um, as well as um, some other researchers from Stanford and TRI. Um, what it consists of is an LLM backbone, uh, the LAMA2 model, uh, as well as uh, a double uh, vision encoder. So we take the Dino V2 vision encoder, which is known to have good spatial representations, um, as well as the SIGLIP vision encoder, which is known to have uh, good image language uh, embeddings. And we fuse those two together, uh, and that's the backbone that we use um, for the VLA model. Uh, what is OpenVLA trained on? It's trained on uh, almost 1 million robot episodes from the OpenX embodiment data set. Uh, and this includes 27 different uh, real robot data sets. Uh, which is 15 more data sets than RT2X, um, the previous uh, state-of-the-art model. Uh, what are the inputs and outputs of, of OpenVLA? Uh, basically, the inputs are simple. It's just a prompt with a single image and a language instruction. So for example, uh, it might look like this. You have an image, and then you have a prompt template that asks, what action should the robot take to blank, uh, where blank is some uh, language instruction? And then uh, the output is a tokenized robot action for a single time step. Uh, I'll go get into details about what this looks like exactly uh, later on in the presentation. Cool. Uh, what robots can OpenVLA control? Um, various robots, including the Widow X robot, which is shown on the left. Uh, the robot used at Google, um, used, which is shown in the middle, and uh, the Franca Emica Panda robots, uh, shown on the right. Uh, these are robots that we evaluated on. Um, the model is trained on uh, many different data sets, so uh, whatever robot shows in the pre-training mixture, um, you can control those for uh, with, with this model. Um, and as I said, everything is fully open source. Oh. OK, uh, so how is OpenVLA trained? Um, we basically do imitation learning, uh, specifically behavior cloning with expert demonstrations, uh, which is a supervised learning um, method. And here, uh, the setup is that uh, we're given a data set of many trajectories. Um, and trajectories contain uh, these observation action pairs uh, for a given episode. And the goal is to train a model pi that predicts uh, the correct action. In our setup, each action um, is actually discretized, which means that every single action at every single time step, you can represent it as a string of seven tokens. And I'll go into the details of uh, what that looks like in the next few slides, um, but basically, because the action is discretized like this, we can treat uh, OpenVLA training like a classification problem, um, just like an LLM. So you can actually train OpenVLA via next token prediction uh, with cross-entropy loss. And the benefit of doing this is that you don't have to modify the architecture at all. So uh, we talked about um, using the prismatic VLM as the backbone. Uh, we didn't modify that architecture at all. 
Um, so here's an example of a prompt and a response. You have a third-person image of a robot in a scene. Uh, this is the Widow X robot that I mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, this is the third-person image. Uh, this is the temp prompt template. And uh, put eggplant into pot is the language instruction here. And then at the bottom of the prompt and response, you have the robot action uh, for a single time step. And uh, this is just a seven-dimensional vector that looks like this. You have um, delta position and rotation values, as well as uh, delta gripper action. Um, and I'll expand upon this more in, in a future slide. Uh, but one thing important to note here um, is that this is actually an action for a single time step t. Uh, so this is yeah a single action. It's not a series of seven actions. Uh, and when you take this and tokenize it, uh, you get a bunch of tokens like this. And um, we basically mask out all the tokens except for the robot action tokens. And the open VLA model at train time is trained to predict just the seven robot action tokens only. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's uh, via uh, autoaggressive uh, next token prediction. So uh, the setup is fairly simple, um, but I didn't talk about how the robot action is actually tokenized. Like, how do you actually get these uh, seven tokens on the right side of the screen? So that's what I'll talk about next. And basically, the robot action space consists of seven dimensions. Uh, the first six are for uh, the delta um, end defector pose. And basically, this means like how much to uh, move the robot's hand in the XYZ direction and how much to rotate it. Um, and the final dimension is a gripper control that's just binary, where 0 means to close the robot hand fully, and 1 means to open it fully. And what we do is basically, for each of these dimensions, uh, we normalize it to lie in the range negative 1 to 1. And then we discretize it into 255 bins uniformly. So what this might look like uh, for one dimension um, is like this. So you have uh, 255 bins um, that cut up the, the action range. And then you do the same thing for uh, the rest of the action dimensions, like this. And after you do this, um, you'll see that each action can be represented by just a string of seven tokens for each of the seven dimensions. Uh, for example, if you have a raw action vector uh, that looks like this, after tokenizing, you can get something like this. And this is a string of um, yeah, token IDs. And the benefit of doing this is that you actually only need 255 tokens to represent the entire action space. Um, and one last note here is that in practice, uh, we override the 255 least frequently used tokens in the uh, LLM's vocabulary. Um, there's various things you could do here. You could actually just like define your own um, special tokens for this, but we found this implementation to be uh, simplest. Um, but also very effective. OK. Uh, I'll pause here for any burning clarification questions, just because this is a little bit technical. Um, if not, then I'll keep moving on. I don't think there are any. OK, Sebastian, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm curious how, what the benefit is of discretizing it this way versus just using the uh, integer representation in a string using the default tokenizer? Yes. OK, that's a great question. Um, so why do we tokenize it this way instead of just using the tokens for the integers? Um, the real reason is that the uh, Llama 2 tokenizer that we used here, um, it actually only has uh, tokens for the integers 0 through 9. So we don't actually have um, like atomic tokens for uh, 11 through like or 10 through 255. Uh, so it's really a practical reason. Um, this is in, con uh, in contrast to uh, some other models like RT2x, uh, and yeah, their, their uh, backbone has um, a vocabulary where like 
up to, I think, I might be wrong, but it might be like up to a thousand. Um, so one through a thousand might have uh, individual tokens. But here it's really just a practical reason. Um, so why do we still not use integer tokens? It's because um, if you want to like spit out a token like 132, for example, you'll need three tokens to represent that if you use integer tokens uh, rather than just one as we're doing here. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. For sure. Okay, awesome. I'll keep moving on uh, for sake of time. Uh, yeah, one note that I put here is that uh, RT2X, um, it has various uh, variants, um, but one of the variants, uh, which uses the Palm E backbone, uh, actually uses a very similar tokenization scheme, and we mostly borrow from them. Um, yeah, we just had some minor variations on how we normalize the actions, and you can find details in the paper. Cool. OK, now diving straight into the experiments. Um, the main experimental questions here were, first, um, how does OpenVLA compare to uh, prior generalist manipulation policies when deployed out of the box? Um, and the second question that we wanted to answer was, uh, can OpenVLA be effectively fine-tuned on a new robot setup uh, and or task? We also have additional experiments. Uh, for example, uh, one thing that I mentioned earlier, can we use parameter-efficient fine-tuning methods such as LoRa to fine-tune OpenVLA um, if you have a smaller compute budget? Um, and lastly, can we use quantization at test time to load and run the model uh, if you have limited GPU memory? Um, so we answer all these questions, and um, I'll focus on the first two first. And if we have time, then we can go through the additional experiments. Um, for the first experiment, the out-of-the-box evaluations, um, we are comparing several, we're comparing OpenVLA against several baselines. Uh, first, we have RT1X, which is a 35 million uh, parameter model. This is a transformer model that uses a film-conditioned efficient net uh, image encoder uh, with a pre-trained uh, language embedding. It's trained on uh, 12 data sets from the OpenX embodiment data sets. And uh, it's trained mostly from scratch. Uh, I say mostly because uh, they use a pre-trained uh, language embedder. But everything else is uh, trained from scratch. Um, another baseline is Octo, which, uh, which was published in uh, RSS uh, 2024. Uh, this is a 93, par 93 million parameter model. And um, it was the prior state-of-the-art open source uh, manipulation policy out there. Um, this is a transformer model that has uh, flexible input and output uh, specifications. And it, um, one detail is that they use uh, diffusion um, in the action head to uh, regress to uh, actions. And this model was trained on um, more than double the number of data sets. So it's trained on 25 data sets from OpenX. And this includes the 12 data sets used in RT1X. Uh, again, this is mostly from scratch, which uh, means that the transformer um, architecture was uh, trained from scratch, but they used um, some pre-trained components, such as um, the language embedder. Um, importantly, we also compare against RT2X, which is a 55 billion parameter model. Um, and this was the prior state-of-the-art closed source generalist policy. Uh, and this was developed at Google DeepMind. Um, and what they did here is they took a pre-trained PolyX vision language model, uh, which has a 22 billion parameter VIT image encoder uh, and 32 billion encoder decoder LLM backbone. And then they fine-tuned that on the same data set as RT1X. Um, and uh, finally, uh, our model it has 7 billion parameters. And as I mentioned, it takes the pre-trained prismatic vision language model. And um, this comp consists of uh, a dual vision encoder uh, with uh, less than 1 billion parameter model, 1 billion parameters total, um, as well as a 7 billion parameter LAMA2 LLM. And then we fine tune that on uh, even more data. So 
uh, out of all these methods, OpenVLA uh, is fine-tuned on um, the most data sets. And this 27 data sets is a superset uh, of all the data sets that um, RT1X and Octo and RT2X are trained on. OK, uh, that was a lot of details on baselines. Um, some more uh, details on the robot setup. So uh, we evaluate mostly on two setups, uh, the Bridge V2 uh, Widow X robot, as well as the Google RTX robot. Um, and for the first setup, we evaluate on 17 different tasks, uh, 10 rollouts per task. And we test against various axes of out of distribution generalization, um, which includes visual, motion, physical, and semantic. And I have examples of what this looks like uh, soon. We also test on language grounding tasks. Um, and here, we basically want to assess if you have multiple objects in the scene, can the model correctly manipulate the, uh, the target object that the user specifies? So you might have um, two episodes. Um, and in each episode, you have like two objects. The user tells the robot to manipulate one object in one episode. And in the next episode, uh, the, robot, the user asks the robot to manipulate the other one. And you fix the initial state. Um, and in this way, you rigorously test whether the model can um, yeah, adapt to different user prompts and be grounded in language. Cool. So in terms of visual generalization, here are some sample tasks. So um, yeah, basically, visual generalization means you're generalizing to uh, different uh, object appearances, like a different cup color or a different type of uh, pots in this example, or even to just large clutter um, or unseen destructor objects. Uh, these are basically uh, all uh, OpenVLA policy rollouts that I'll be showing in the next few slides. Um, here are some motion generalization tasks. So here we have the robot generalizing um, to unseen object positions, which requires a different motion than what it's used to at training time, um, as well as generalizing to like unseen platforms to cut objects on. Um, so yeah, the, the idea here is to um, test whether the, the robot can basically reach and uh, place objects in unseen positions. Uh, physical generalization looks like this. Uh, you might have unseen uh, sizes and shapes of certain objects. Uh, so in the original British data set, we were trained on um, smaller pots that are like taller um, and more narrow. And here we have an example of generalizing to like a really small object, which is um, not really seen in the bridge data sets. OK, and the final category is semantic generalization. Here you might be manipulating some unseen target objects, like the skull toy. Um, and in addition, like we have tasks where uh, we test whether the model can generalize to unseen language instructions. So it has never seen an instruction like this in this environment in the bridge data set. And finally, uh, in terms of the language grounding tasks, here uh, we see that it's the same initial state for both episodes, um, but the prompt is different. And um, the, the test is to manipulate the correct one, um, the correct target object that the user specifies. OK, and jumping straight into the results. So this is our um, main bridge results figure. Um, just to like break it down so it's easier to parse, uh, all, the, all the bar plots are the same, um, but the leftmost is RT1X. This is Octo. Uh, RT2X is in green, and OpenVLA is in red. So the TLDR here is that OpenVLA is the strongest in most task categories, um, except for semantic generalization. And there, we found that RT2X um, perform, outperforms OpenVLA just slightly. And we, hypo we hypothesize that this is um, due to um, either like larger scale internet pre-training, uh, because the, the base VLM 
uh, in RFD2X was trained on lots and lots of uh, internet data. And it, it, so it's either that, or uh, we also hypothesize that it's um, because RT2X co-fine-tuned uh, on both robot data and uh, vision language model pre-training data. Um, so what this means is uh, when they fine-tuned the VLM, they may have, or they, they fine-tuned on both uh, robot interaction data as well as the pre-training data used to produce the VLM. Uh, on the other hand, OpenVLA was only fine-tuned on robot data alone. Uh, overall, though, we find that OpenVLA performs best and outperforms the next best model, uh, RT2X, uh, by uh, 20%. And this is an absolute success so rate. Cool. OK, and in terms of some qualitative results, uh, we see that in a scene with many distractor objects, OpenVLA can approach and manipulate the correct target object, um, as shown below. Um, similarly, uh, we see that OpenVLA has uh, good language grounding. Um, so we can prompt the model to manipulate different target objects given the same initial states, um, as shown here. You can see that the state is fixed, uh, the initial state is fixed, but the robot manipulates the uh, correct object based on the prompt. OK, and um, one nice thing we, notice, we noticed is that in some cases, uh, the model might make a mistake like this, uh, but then it can actually recover and successfully complete the task because it's a closed loop policy. Um, and basically, it takes the the current image um, and predicts the next action. And it does this in a closed loop fashion. Um, so if it makes a mistake, it can correct itself. OK, so I talked about the bridge uh, data um, evaluations. We also evaluated on the Google robot. And here we did a smaller evaluation suite with just 12 tasks. And this includes five in-distribution tasks, as well as seven out-of-distribution generalization tasks. Um, and we generalized to different unseen objects, backgrounds, uh, object relations, as well as web data concepts. Uh, some sample and distribution tasks are shown here. And yeah, it's basic tasks like pick and place, um, as well as like opening drawers. And then here are some sample OOD generalization tests on the Google robot. So you might have unseen uh, objects and backgrounds or unseen like instructions, um, and even unseen photos from the internet. Uh, so there's this canonical move Coke can to Taylor Swift example, where you, you're supposed to grab the Coke can and um, move it to the photo of Taylor Swift, uh, given uh, various other celebrities. And uh, RT2X was shown to have done this sort of generalization well due to its internet uh, pre-training. Cool. Jumping into the results, uh, we find that OpenVLA and RT2X perform comparably here. Um, I say comparably, even though that even though uh, OpenVLA has a slight edge because uh, the error bars are overlapping, um, and RT1X and Octo um, perform comparably to each other as well. Um, however, they both uh, significantly underperform compared to the vision language action models. Um, yeah, and in terms of some qualitative results. Uh, we find that both RT2X and OpenVLA can uh, sort of reliably do the more basic in-distribution and um, easy OD generalization tasks like this. Uh, however, uh, as we saw in the bridge evaluations, RT2X actually performs better on the more uh, difficult semantic generalization tasks. So for example, for this Taylor Swift uh, Coke can task, we find that OpenVLA uh, often struggles. And again, we believe that this is due to um, us not fine tuning the, whole, the full model on um, the VLM pre trained data and only fine tuning it on robot action data. So over time, it may be uh, forgetting concepts um, that are unseen or, or like wildly unseen um, in the robot uh, data set. 
Cool. So we answered the first question, um, and we found that OpenVLA can um, outperform prior generalist policies when deployed out of the box. Um, the next main experimental question um, is whether OpenVLA can be fine-tuned on a new robot setup and task. So for this, uh, we compare against various baselines, including um, the full diffusion policy trained from scratch. And uh, one note here is that the full diffusion policy contains additional bells and whistles uh, compared to OpenVLA, which means that it takes like additional inputs um, and has additional outputs through um, action chunking. Uh, we also compare against a diffusion policy match, which is a version of diffusion policy uh, that matches the inputs and outputs of um, OpenVLA. We also compare against uh, fine-tune methods. Um, so we take Octo and uh, fine-tune it on the same uh, downstream data sets. Um, and um, yeah, another method that we compare against is OpenVLA Scratch. Uh, this is just a quick ablation where uh, we don't uh, pre-train on any robot action data, and we just fine-tune the base VLM. So this is basically for the sake of assessing whether um, it's important to pre-train on the robot data set. And of course, we have our full uh, open VLA model, um, and this is uh, the method that, uh, that we uh, mostly um, evaluate. <clears throat> Cool. And in terms of the setups, uh, we tested it on two uh, real-world uh, Franca Panda setups uh, called Franca Tabletop and Franca Droid. Um, the Franca Tabletop tasks include three narrow single instruction tasks. And basically, th this is like a single skill task where it's not important to have language grounding. Um, and then we also uh, evaluate on three diverse multi-instruction tasks. So here you might have uh, distracted objects uh, and various language instructions. Um, and basically the, the model has to uh, react and um, do the right thing given uh, the user's prompts. And then the Franca droid task, uh, is, it's a single instruction task. Um, it's called Franca droid because we use the same hardware setup from the recently released droid dataset paper. Um, and uh, this was another paper um, that made it into RSS 2024. Cool, so the narrow single instruction task look like this. You just have um, a simple setup and you have to just do one uh, skill. And we collect between like 50, or usually like around 50 demos for each task. Uh, and we also test against out of distribution variants of this task, like shown here. Uh, so you might use like a different object or um, unseen backgrounds uh, as shown in the bottom. Um, and the diverse multi-instruction. Oh, yes. Is there it a seems question? like Marcos has a, has a burning question. Yes. Marcos. Hi there. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, because in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned just taking uh, a third person view image. And now I see this it looks what looks like a real sense uh, dev camera on the gripper. So could you please explain what's the input here? Yes, uh, great question. Um, so the input to all these uh, policies is just the third person image that you're seeing here. Um, the reason why there is an additional camera mounted on the robot's wrist is because this robot was used for a different project um, that uh, used uh, multiple inputs. Um, but yeah, you can just ignore the camera on the robot's wrist. Uh, we're not taking any inputs from that camera for this project. Um, a good, good clarification question. Cool. Um, and moving on, so these are the uh, diverse multi-instruction tasks. Uh, here, um, there are multiple objects in the scene, and the user specifies which object to manipulate. Uh, and we have like basic pick and place tasks, we have uh, knocking tasks, as well as um, tasks with um, a deformable object, such as, a, such as a towel. And again, we have OOD variants of this task. So uh, using different objects or a distractor 
um, objects or even like different um, object positions and orientations. And the final task is this wiping task. We want to show that we can um, do tasks that involve like different behaviors such as uh, wiping. So the task here is to uh, grab the sweeper and sweep the uh, food items into the dustpan. And again, we have an in-distribution and an out-of-distribution uh, variant of this task. OK, jumping straight into the, the uh, main uh, experiments figure. So uh, again, to parse the bar plots, we first have the diffusion policy variants in the blue and gray. And then there's Octo, OpenVLA trained from scratch, um, as well as a full OpenVLA. And uh, what we found is that the diffusion policy variants actually perform best in the narrow single instruction tasks um, where language grounding is not important. Um, and uh, qualitatively, here are some videos to show this. So we have diffusion policy on the left, and it can do the task um, well. And um, in the middle and on the right, we have Octo and OpenVLA, respectively. And um, these are actually uh, cherry-picked failures. Um, of course, these, these methods uh, can do the task sometimes, but um, these are just examples of how it fails. Um, on the other hand, we find that OpenVLA performs best in uh, four out of the seven tasks. Um, and uh, it does especially well in the diverse multi-instruction tasks where language grounding is important. Uh, so for example, here, um, we have three methods again, and we see that diffusion policy on the top left um, actually manipulates the wrong object. On the bottom left, it actually uh, fails to even touch any object. Uh, Octo in the middle gets pretty close. Um, so it shows that it has good language grounding by going to the right object, but it doesn't fully finish the task. And then on the right, uh, we see that OpenVLA um, is able to uh, complete the task with the correct object. Um, breaking it down further, we also observe that Octo exhibits pretty strong language grounding uh, as well, and it performs uh, fairly well on two out of three of the diverse multi-instruction tasks. However, it struggles on the narrow single instruction tasks, uh, and it may be that the fine-tuning data set is too narrow um, for it to um, for it to be fine-tuned on, and it may be overfitting to them um, st more strongly than uh, OpenVLA does. Uh, overall, we see that OpenVLA performs the strongest and outperforms the next best baseline by 20% uh, absolute success rate on average. And it's also the only method to get at least 50% success rate um, in all tasks. So we show that it's a good default um, to begin with if you want to uh, starts training on a new task. Uh, lastly, the uh, from scratch uh, OpenVLA model uh, without any sort of robot pre-training, um, that one seems to struggle overall, which shows that uh, the robot pre-training is actually crucial if you want to achieve a good fine-tuning performance. Uh, and some qualitative examples we see here uh, on the left, that the from scratch baseline is uh, unable to do the task reliably. Um, sometimes it even goes towards the wrong object that's shown on the bottom left. And then on the right, uh, OpenVLA is able to uh, complete these tasks uh, more reliably. And this just shows that it's important. Um, it's important that we have fine-tuned um, the model on, on the OpenX data set. Cool, and you can check out our website for even more qualitative results. Uh, is there another question? Uh, Xavier? Hi. Uh, yes, uh, I got a question about this uh, fine tuning. So for the data set collected, um, is it, for example, I saw you mentioned 50 to 60. Is there a sweet spot you think that, like, is there a, I'm wondering if there's a performance relationship strong relationship with the with the numbers there and also how different are those different episodes like these objects in in different locations right okay that's a great question so 
Uh, firstly, in terms of uh, the number of episodes and its relation to performance, uh, we actually didn't um, try like like various like numbers of demonstrations for each task. Uh, we sort of just relied on intuition to just pick some number of demonstrations. Um, and the idea was to just try to cover like the table, um, like the state, the state space um, as much as possible. So we found that like 50 was like a good number uh, for a lot of these tasks. Um, you may have seen that for the diverse multi-instruction tasks, we needed more demonstrations, like uh, 150, for example, for some of them. Um, and this is just because um, there was like lots of different objects and lots of permutations of them. So we wanted to uh, get enough coverage of the state space. Um, however, like you actually don't need that many demonstrations if you are testing on like a narrower sp state space. So for example, for this flip pot upright task, like this third task um, in this row here, uh, we actually only collected 10 demonstrations. Um, and that's because the pot position um, was very, uh, it had a very low variance and it was just really in that uh, small section of the table. Um, so you can actually fine tune this large billion parameter model, even on 10 demonstrations and get it to do the task. Um, yeah, and sorry, Great, I won't thanks. Like part of your question. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and like how different are these different episodes for, for the data? Is this just uh, objects in different locations? Yes, uh, great question. Yeah, so for the different episodes, uh, so the different demonstrations, um, uh, all the all the uh, objects are like scrambled, so they're like moved in different locations. Um, at evaluation time, um, it's that as well as um, different like uh, different uh, objects in the OOD generalization cases. Um, so you might have like different distractor objects in the background, um, as well as like different target objects entirely. But mostly, it's just like a shifting of the objects on the table. Cool. Thanks for the questions, Zaya. Awesome. Thank you. Is there another question, or are we good? We'll um, we'll, we'll let you wrap up your talk, and we'll make questions on the um, on the chat alone, just so we can prioritize them. Because there are more questions than are going to be able to be answered in the time that we have. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. Cool. Let me uh, wrap up then. Um, so. We showed that OpenVLA can be fine-tuned effectively on uh, new robot tasks. And I think, unfortunately, we won't be able to go into the additional experiments in much detail, but I'll give you the a quick TLDR. Um, yeah, let me just uh, jump oh, through this. One thing, one thing Mujin, if you've got like five to 10 minutes to stay over, uh, for the questions, then maybe you can you can expand on this a little bit more right now. W would you would you be able to stay a little bit more for the questions after? Yep, that sounds great. Excellent, uh, thank you. Cool. Okay, then in that case, uh, I will go into uh, some detail for these additional experiments. Um, but basically, the question we want to answer here is: Do we actually need to fully fine tune the model to get good performance? So, in all the previous fine tuning experiments, we actually fine-tuned all 7 million parameter models. Um, and yeah, surprisingly, it actually does uh, quite well. Um, with augmentations, it doesn't overfit, and it's able to get reasonable performance. But maybe you don't have so much compute um, to actually do this full fine-tuning. And uh, in that case, these parameter-efficient fine-tuning methods may be more helpful. So uh, we compared various fine-tuning strategies in our paper. Um, and uh, just to quickly go through them, this last layer only method uh, fine tunes only the last layer of the LLM backbone and freezes everything else. Uh, frozen vision, um, in this method, we freeze the vision encoder, but then we unfreeze everything else. So we're still fine tuning through the whole LLM backbone, um, just keeping the vision uh, encoder frozen. Sandwich fine tuning means that we fine tune the vision encoder, so that's at the beginning of the network, as well as the uh, last layer of the LLM, which is at the end of the network. Um, and then everything else in between is frozen. And that's why we call it like a, a sandwich, it's like a frozen sandwich. Um, and then the last uh, parameter efficient fine tuning method that we try is LoRa. Um, and this is a, a popular low rank adaptation method. 
um, that was widely used in the LLM literature. And it's applied to all the linear layers of both the vision and language backbones. Um, it may be hard to quickly understand all these, but I encourage you to uh, check out the paper for more details. Um, but basically, we compare these on a subset of the Franca tabletop tasks that we showed earlier. And um, we find that LoRa is actually the most effective. Uh, with a rank of 32, you're actually only training only 1.4% of the 7 billion parameters. Um, but you can actually match the full, finding, full fine tuning performance um, shown in the top row. And you're doing this with like a uh, much lower VRAM utilization uh, as well, which is great. On the other hand, we find that some of the other, other partial fine tuning methods don't do so hot. Uh, for example, if you freeze the vision encoder, um, that typically is uh, going to lead to poor, poor, poor performance. Um, and this is even if you fine tune the entire LLM backbone. So um, yeah, like even if you're training like almost 7 billion parameter models, um, if you're fine tuning the wrong parts of the model, uh, that can be detrimental. Um, we find that the sandwich fine tuning method, uh, which only fine tunes the vision encoder and the LLM last layer, uh, this, this has a boost in performance compared to um, the frozen vision encoder methods, uh, but it's still not as good as uh, LoRa. But basically what this shows is that um, it's important to fine tune the vision encoder. Okay, and uh, so we talked about um, uh, PEFT uh, techniques for uh, fine tuning the model with lower compute. Um, what if you don't care about fine tuning at all and you just want to run the model? Um, do you need a large uh, GPU uh, to run these models? Um, actually, no, you don't. Uh, so you can use 4-bit quantization at test time to load and run the model uh, with uh, lower uh, GPU, me GPU memory. Uh, so normally what we do um, without quantization is that we cast OpenVLA to a uh, half precision, which is the BFlow16 data type at test time. And this requires um, around 16 gigabytes of GPU memory. Um, but if you use int for quantization, um, basically you only need seven gigabytes of VRAM to run OpenVLA. Um, and this is nice because uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, non-server grade GPUs uh, have sufficient memory for this. And what's also nice is that we didn't actually observe any performance degradation in our evaluations. And this was on a subset of bridge data tasks, uh, not on the full evaluation suite. So um, things may differ if we had evaluated on more. But um, at least on the subset of tasks, we didn't observe any sort of performance degradation, which was surprising. Um, another uh, slightly surprising uh, finding is that the 8-bit quantization um, actually didn't perform as well. Um, and this is potentially due to just like different implementations of the quantization uh, between int8 and int4. Um, but this implementation of the 8-bit quantization um, led to lower inference speed. And this may have messed up the dynamics at test time. And that may, be, they, that may have been a confounding factor in our evaluations. But basically, we find that 4-bit quantization at inference time uh, worked pretty well. OK, um, let me just uh, quickly uh, fast forward through these um, last few slides. Uh, but basically, um, there's a few design decisions that we made and some insights that we've gained from this project. Uh, first, which vision language model uh, to fine tune? So obviously, there's lots of uh, VLMs out there. How do we decide on the prismatic VLM? So we actually tried three different ones, the Itafix uh, V1 model, uh, Lava V1.5, and the Prismatic VLM. And we, file, we found that um, Lava outperformed Itafix by quite a significant amount, like 35% in absolute success rates. Um, but then the performance, and then like moving on to Prismatic um, VLMs, the performance increase uh, started to diminish, diminish a little bit, even though the underlying VLM was much better. Uh, if you use a better VLM, then 
uh, probably the performance of OpenVLA uh, would be better as well. In terms of image resolution, we tried both 224 by 224 and 384 by 384 um, pixels. And for us, we observed, observed no difference in the performance in our uh, bridge evaluations. Um, however, the 384 pixel resolution just took three times longer to train because you have uh, many more patches and many more uh, tokens to train on. Uh, so we just opted for the smaller image resolution. Um, this question about whether to freeze or fine tune the vision encoder uh, was an important question for us because uh, prior work on vision language models found that freezing the vision encoder uh, led to much better performance because you don't disturb the pre-trained uh, visual representations. However, for us, we actually found the opposite. And basically, fine-tuning was crucial for uh, both the zero-shot experiments and the fine-tuning experiments. Um, and our intuition here is that uh, perhaps the pre-trained vision representations um, aren't uh, sufficient for a robotic control yet, because maybe uh, they haven't been fine-tuned for uh, robotic control tasks. Oh, sorry, I meant uh, they haven't been pre-trained on the robot robotic control tasks. Uh, and how long to train these models? We actually consistently found that just training for longer was better. Uh, for example, we went through 30 epochs of the OpenX uh, mixture that we described. Uh, this is in contrast to prior um, VLM works that may go through like one or two epochs only. Uh, which learning rates? Uh, we did a hyperparameter sweep, and we actually found that using the same learning rates used in the VLM pre-training phase uh, led to the best results. And by best results, I mean it, it learned uh, fastest and still maintained good performance. And a nice thing is that we kept it very simple, and we just used a constant learning rate. So no need to do linear decay. Um, and uh, despite doing this, we still uh, observed strong performance. Um, it's possible that uh, you could optimize this further with different learning rate schedules um, and get even better performance, but we found that it was not necessary for our evaluations. Cool. Uh, in terms of limitations, uh, so OpenVLA is a, it's a strong model. Um, it's currently the state-of-the-art generalist model, but there are several limitations. Uh, first, it only supports single-frame inputs and single-step uh, actions. Um, and the reason is like this is a large model with billions of parameters. Um, and on a local GPU, the training and inference speed is very low. Um, if you have even more inputs and outputs, uh, the speed would be even lower, uh, which would not be great when you're trying to deploy these models on real hardware. So the question here would be, um, yeah, how would the performance change if we did have these additional inputs? Um, and somehow like sped up the model so that um, it didn't, um, yeah, it was it, it would be able to um, it would be able to run on uh, local GPUs on real hardware. Um, another limitation is that there is lack of support for high frequency controllers and by bi manual manipulation robots because we pre train mostly on a single arm uh, robot data sets. Uh, for example. Uh, you can't deploy OpenVLA on Aloha or uh, other um, other bimanual manipulators out of the box. Uh, fine tuning is a different question, though, and uh, that could be a nice future work. Um, and yeah, the reason here is, uh, as I mentioned, it's hard to run these models at high frequency. Um, even when we're using remote H100 servers, at best we could only run the model at like seven seven to nine hertz. Um, for local GPUs, we got it to run at like three hertz uh, best. Um, so it will be interesting to see if uh, VLM inference speedup tricks um, that are like well known in the literature um, can also enable high frequency control for VLA models. So that could be a nice future work. Um, another limitation is that the VLM. Um, the pre-trained VLM is only uh, fine-tuned on robot action data, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're not fine-tuning on both robot and VQA data, um, as done in RT2. And as I mentioned earlier, this may lead to uh, some sort of catastrophic forgetting 
of the pre-training concepts um, that don't appear in the robot interaction data. Um, and uh, if we had more compute, um, it would be a good question to um, explore and um, like whether co-fine tuning can be used to improve uh, generalization performance and prevent catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so there's lots of questions that come up from these limitations, and we hope that the res uh, other researchers can build off of OpenBLA to answer some of these questions. Okay, um, I'm super thankful for my amazing collaborators uh, listed here. Um, it was a pleasure to work with everyone on this team. And also thank you all for listening, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Mujin. That was really awesome. So uh, for the questions, I, this is a record number of questions by far for any of the robot paper discussions. So nice one, Mujin. Um, so I'm just uh, I'm gonna like clear the slate for questions here. We'll take questions only in the um, in the message box if that's okay. Put an asterisk in front of your question if you want to unmute. Otherwise, I'm just gonna read your question for you, uh, and I'm gonna try to prioritize them by how specific they are to this talk, the variety they introduce to the questions, uh, and you know. Uh, I'll try to give everyone a turn. So anyone who's already asked the question, I'll, I'll deprioritize just a little bit. Um, okay, so I've got one question up right now from Vitali. Um, is it possible to use smaller LLMs for the backbone? Uh, like, can you use a model like Phi 3 Mini? Um, and would it, do you think it would perform at the same level as Llama 2, given enough training? That's a great question. Uh, can you use a smaller LLM? Um, you certainly can. Um, the only difficulty here would be that you would have to uh, either do all the pre-training again um, or try to distill this model into that smaller model. Um, but yeah, I think this is a great like open question. And uh, I, I think as long as the, um, the underlying like vision language model has good spatial awareness um, and good object detection, uh, I think it, it would be sufficient for um, BLA, um, BLA fine tuning. Um, yeah, so I, I think like as you improve the the base VLM, uh, performance will increase. Uh, however, uh, if if the base VLM has like sufficient uh, understanding of like physical scenes, then um, it should be good enough. But uh, yeah, I think it, it is a good question and not something that is worth exploring. All right, and let's um, let's let's actually piggyback on that question and go the opposite direction. Someone says, uh, Barbunia says, um, what about? Are you thinking about using bigger backbones like Llama three four hundred five billion? Do we have enough data to effectively leverage these? That's a great question. Um, so Llama three point one was uh, just released yesterday, and uh, they have like a four hundred billion parameter model. Um, for us. Uh, Due to being based in academia, we probably won't be uh, fine-tuning a model that large. Um, but in theory, like it should, it should be able to um, be used for VLA pre-training. Um, but yeah, it will just take a long, long time to train because it's another order of magnitude larger than the current OpenVLA model. Uh, so to provide some insights for the training of OpenVLA, um, it's a seven billion parameter model. Um, and we used 64 A100s um, for 14 weeks to train the model. And this was uh, thanks to Toyota Research who provided the, the computes, um, but you would have to use a lot, a lot more computes to um, train a model that large. Uh, but I would expect it to work as well, uh, provided that you have uh, sufficient um, amounts of robot data. Um, Julian also, uh, this is another question, but he said Llama 3 with 405 billion parameters is, is the Terminator. So I find that pretty funny. Um, so the, I'm going to chain two questions together here. Um, there's one from, uh, and they're, they're both, both about next steps. So Namra says, now that we have state-of-the-art open source VLA model, but we're still not that great at out of distribution tasks and long horizon tasks, what research questions do you really want to see answered in the next year? And just one second, because Simon also asks, uh, what are the next steps following your work and what component would you say 
uh, I mean, what's what's the next uh, low hanging fruit for um, improving success rates? Great. Um, let me ask, answer the second question first. Uh, in terms of the low hanging fruits, uh, I mentioned like several limitations in terms of the current model, which is that um, we have like basically like a, a single step policy where uh, we take a single step as input and as predict a single action as output. And um, as you saw, the diffusion, the full diffusion policy baseline in the fine tuning experiments had various bells and whistles that improved this performance. Um, so we would expect those sort of things to also improve OpenBLA. Um, another thing that I didn't touch upon too much was uh, one of the baselines, Octo, uh, uses uh, diffusion to regress to continuous valued actions. And um, generally, like diffusion is a very expressive um, method that can uh, learn uh, pretty multimodal policies. And um, yeah, it, it would be like a, a nice thing to figure out whether um, VLA models can be adapted with diffusion um, to perform even better, uh, or whether these uh, autoregressive next token prediction models um, are still uh, more powerful. So th that was, that's still an open question, and we don't know for sure. So those are some low-hanging fruit that people um, can look into. Um, could you remind me the, the first the first question, Alex? So the first question from Namra was, uh, I'll just read it for Vaden. Now that we have a state-of-the-art open source VLA model, but we are still not great at out-of-distribution tasks and long horizon tasks, what research mm -hmm. questions do you really want to see answered in the next year? So maybe you've answered part of that, but, but let me know if you think that you want to add more. Right. So in terms of the generalization abilities, um, I think um, one research question is like, how important is the co-fine tuning exactly? Um, I had mentioned that co-fine tuning on robot action data and internet pre-training data um, may have uh, allowed might may have enabled RT2X to do better semantic generalization. Um, however, um, it's not super clear because uh, the VQAP training data set um, is, is really just like visual question answering um, on um, like static images. And um, it's not really clear like how much transfers. So uh, one nice question that's still open is like, like how do we get things to like transfer better to robotic control and like how important is this confine tuning uh, exactly and like how much does it improve generalization uh, in terms of long horizon tasks uh, yes it would be nice if uh, these vla models were fine-tuned and adapted to um, long horizon slash bimanual uh, slash dexterous tasks um, most of the skills that we trained on were more short horizon um, and you can think of VLA as like a low level, like a large uh, low level controller uh, that can do various short horizon tasks. Um, it's possible that you can chain these um, skills together to do long horizon tasks, but um, yeah, it would be cool if uh, someone took a VLA model and then um, fine tuned it on uh, like long horizon, like skills, for example, um, that require like lots and lots of time steps. Um, and the uh, the more advanced behaviors than what we've seen in this project, um, but I think those are some nice uh, longer term research uh, questions to explore. Thank you. So, um, two two quick questions in succession that are kind of related. So, um, uh, Marcos asks, like, so if you see uh, failure mode when when you've trained. Uh, VLA, open VLA model for a task. If you see a failure mode, if you then just take those episodes where, or, or take those setups where you saw the failure mode and try to fine tune on those, will, will you be able to address the failure mode? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's like, if if the model fails in a certain way, um, can you sort of correct it? Um, yeah, I think if you do some sort of like dagger style approach where you collect demonstrations in cases where the model fails specifically, um, eventually it should be able to improve. Um, the, the drawback is that you have to uh, really investigate like where it fails and then have a human in the loop to collect more data on top of all the data that it's already fine-tuned on. And then um, 
do another round of fine tuning. But in theory, it, it should work. It's, it's just like another, um, at the end of the day, this is just another imitation learning uh, policy. Um, so anything that you do to improve other imitation learning policies should also work here. And maybe somewhat related, uh, Vitaly asks, um, if you've looked at scaling laws with the amount of fine tuning data, so his, his question for Batum, how much does the success rate drop if given half the samples to fine tune? Uh, and you know, um, have you been able to see where, where it plateaus um, based on the amount of data provided? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, for this project, in terms of scaling laws, we haven't been able to do like extensive analysis um, just because we were uh, pretty limited on computes. Um, however, we have uh, done some ablations where we um, like ablate the OpenX pre-training. So for example, for the bridge evaluations, uh, we have tried just training uh, VLA models on bridge only um, versus bridge plus all the uh, other data sets in the OpenX mixture. And we did find that the additional rollout data um, did improve performance um, substantially. Uh, however, yeah, we don't have like very fine grained uh, analysis for this, unfortunately. So, like, how much the performance differs if you cut the training data by half? Um, that, that's an excellent question, but unfortunately, we don't know the exact answer there. Um, but we do find that generally, like, more OpenX pre training. Um, led to better performance. Thank you. So Remy and Matt are asking, uh, uh, um, are, are deltas? So you said the the um, the way that you look at you look at the tasks, the uh, sorry, the x y z components like delta x, delta y, delta c. So are these deltas in the grouper frame or the world frame? Um, that's a good question. So uh, the delta x y z's, and let me try to pull up the slide where we talked about that. Yeah, so these deltas, um, these are in the the robots base base frame, um, so they're not in the the gripper frame. So, um, yeah, if the robot was oriented differently, um, that that changes things. But a lot of the data sets they have the robot oriented in this sort of top down manner. Um, there are some data sets where that's not the case, and uh, we don't really do any sort of like manual alignment of the data sets. Um, we really just let the model learn what it needs to to figure out the alignment on its own. Um, the, the alignment in terms of like the coordinate frame and like what actions it should output. Um, but yes, these are in the, the robots uh, base frame. Uh, Xavier, would you like to unmute for your question? Yes. Uh, another question about the dance signal. So I see that OpenVLA is not trained uh, on the dance signal. Then how does the model know when a task is done? Oh, OK. <laughs> Good question. Um, so yes, yeah. we don't train uh, unless the data set in, yeah, actually, no, we, do, we don't train on um, like a done signal. So uh, really, the model at deployment time, it, it doesn't know when it's done. And you have to like manually stop it. Or um, uh -huh. the, the timer on the episode runs out. Uh, so for example, for the bridge evaluations, um, you might have like 50 time steps, uh, which is like 10 seconds. Uh, and then the model either like does a task um, or not in that time frame. Uh, however, uh, actually some data sets, they may not have like an explicit done signal, but the expert demonstrator may have stopped moving the robot at the end of the episode. So uh, for bridge evaluations, um, we often found that OpenVLA after doing a task, it would just like stay still but it wouldn't terminate itself. Um, yeah, but that's a good question. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, but one one thing to note is that you can add that to the action base if you wanted to. It's just uh, we haven't done that because it's not a universal thing across all these different data sets. Uh, but great question. Yep, thanks. Olivier asks if you uh, checked the Llama 7 billion uh, or the Backbone's performance on NLP tasks after fine tuning it. How much of its prior did it retain? Uh, OK, that's a great question. So after fine tuning it, um, we actually don't expect it to work on uh, the, the other like LLM or VLM 
a pre-training task anymore. And this is because we are doing this full fine tuning of the model. Um, and it's only trained to predict these uh, robot action tokens, which is in a very like limited subset of the uh, model's vocabulary. Um, so if you try to chat with this model, it's, it's not going to work because it's not fine tuned to do that. So really, the OpenVLA model is just for robotic control. Um, however, if you wanted to, uh, you could use other uh, fine tuning uh, methods, such as, um, for example, you, you could do like, I guess in theory, you could try to do, try to do LoRa fine tuning uh, for the pre-training phase. So like, we fully fine tune the model for OpenX pre-training, but what if you used LoRa, or if you use like adapter layers to um, keep the pre-training weights uh, frozen and just modify a smaller subset of weights. Um, in theory, that could be used to uh, recover performance on the pre-training tasks. But for us, because we did full fine tuning, it, it would not work. Um, just a quick one, Alex, uh, you've got a question there, but I'm, I'm not sure I understand it. So if you could just repeat it uh, before I ask it, or put an asterisk and then you can ask it yourself. Um, uh, someone asks, um, they don't have a name here, it's D, why, ch why did you choose actions in Cartesian space? Have you considered generating actions in joint space? That's a great question. Um, so we represent actions in the Cartesian space um, because we thought that it would be, uh, I guess, more um, transferable than the other action representations. So for example, if you did joint space, um, different robots have different numbers of joints. So you actually cannot transfer uh, that those action representations directly. Um, even if you have this, like similar numbers of joints between different robots, um, maybe like different joint angles mean different things um, in terms of like the final pose of the robot. Um, sorry, I'm at different sets of joint angles. Uh, however, for uh, the end effector, like delta uh, pose action space, um, all the robots have like a gripper um, and you can sort of transfer this um, notion of move like left and down um, and rotate this much and close your gripper. Um, you can transfer that sort of uh, notion across different data sets. Um, so really it's just so that we could have a universal action space uh, for all these different data sets that we pre-trained on. Um, However, like if you wanted to, uh, I think you could fine tune this model um, with different action spaces, but you have to do some sort of uh, um, design and engineering to figure out how that would look. Um, like whether it's like removing the, um, the last layer or just like retraining the um, output layer. Um, yeah, that, that stuff we haven't explored, but um, yeah, for now we've, we've stuck to this action space. Good question. All right, so uh, last two questions here. I'm, I'm being a little bit overwhelmed. Um, uh, Vitali, I'm not sure. Uh, Vitali, you've got a few questions up. Um, would you like to? Would you like to unmute and just focus on on one of them? Same with Michael. I think you've got two questions that I haven't answered uh, either of them. Or, or repost your question, the one that you really want answered out of the multiple questions that you have up. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, if Vitaly doesn't say anything, then... Yeah, that's okay, Michael, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess the question I wanted to ask are, are there any inductive biases that could be added to the model to reduce the amount of data you need or reduce the model size necessary to get good performance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I, I think it's hard to like figure out the precise inductive biases here, um, but yeah, I would say like for that question, I don't have a good answer, um, especially because we haven't really tested on like uh, different scales um, of the data set or the model. Um, but yeah, I would encourage like other people to. Um, maybe try this if they have the compute. Um, and um, yeah, if you have the compute, you can try this uh, with the full model or you can try um, like, like tiny VLMs 
out there and try to fine tune that. But yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a great answer to that question. Thank you. Vital so last, I said last two questions, but I have Vitalis and then maybe one more. So Vitalis is, um, would adding another output to the model, maybe two actions at a time, so maybe like the action chunking idea, effectively, would it, he asks, would it effectively double the inference rate? And I personally might ask, well, have you considered, you know, multiple action outputs and all the implications that go along with that? Yes, uh, good question. So, um, yes, if you if you do some sort of action chunking, so instead of single step action predictions, you predict um, maybe like two actions or even like ten. Uh, yes, you essentially are um, multiplying like the inference um, delay by a factor of x, where x is like the um, the horizon. And this is because we are predicting these action tokens autoregressively. Um, so even when we predict like a single step action, we're doing seven serial four passes of the um, VLM to produce that action. Um, so if you have like 35 tokens and you have to do 35 serial predictions, so it just like slows down the, um, the inference speed. Uh, that being said, we did uh, try this um, at some point in the project. Um, it does fit the data set uh, just fine. Um, so the training time is good. Um, but, but at deployment time, we found some issues uh, due to the slow inference. Um, the, the VLA model would have to sort of like charge up because uh, it takes such a long time to predict this full action chunk. Um, so you might, you might be limited to predicting um, one action every second or one action, or sorry, one action chunk every second or one action chunk every uh, two seconds. And um, one big drawback for this is that uh, if you pause and act, pause and act like this, you may actually um, introduce the distribution shift at test time, uh, uh, specifically in the robot's dynamics. So uh, at training time, uh, or sorry, at demo collection time, the robot is used to moving um, at like five times per second, but then at test time, if you move it like once or like half a time per second, uh, it introduces this big distribution shift that can be de detrimental to performance. Uh, so we actually observed uh, not great performance with action chunking, so uh, we just went, went with the naive um, single step version. Uh, however, if the, the inference speed uh, were sped up, uh, either through like uh, inference speed up tricks or uh, just using like smaller models in general, then um, we would expect action chunking to uh, work there as well. Uh, great questions. All right. Well, that would be it for questions now. Thank you so much for your time, Mujin. It was um, it was really awesome. Um, and the biggest turnout and most questions we've had so far. So there's obviously a lot of interest in your work. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for all the uh, people asking questions. So, I mean, it doesn't end here, by the way. I mean, we have the uh, Le Robot Discord where people are constantly discussing. Uh, if, if Mujin, if you if you join that Discord, you might be able to chime in. Uh, but there are other people who are also experts in you know various fields related to what Mujin's doing that could also answer your questions. So feel free to open up that sort of discussion on the Discord after this. Um, and you know a few thank yous as well, Mujin, coming uh, in the comments if you if you care to take a look at that. So um, again, thank you everybody for your time and uh, thanks for a great talk. And till next time. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.